Welcome to the next session. Uh, my name is Thomas. I'm the session chair for this session. Some housekeeping rules before we start. So the TLP uh, level will be TLP wide, so you can do whatever you want. Um, then the Q&A will be in the end of the talks, and as you know, here in the middle will be uh, the microphones, uh, which I will be moderating. And it's very important for us to get feedback about this session, so please fill out the session survey in the mobile app best at the end of the session. And now I would like to introduce you to the two speakers, uh, Daniel Schlette from the University of Regensburg and Marco Caselli from uh, Siemens in Germany. And they will talk uh, beyond, about incident, re uh, incident reporting beyond incident response. So the stage is yours. Thanks, Thomas. Hi, everybody. I hope no one is too eager to go to lunch because we will have 30 minutes and uh, we hope also to have uh, you engage with uh, some question and answers at the end of the presentation. So as Thomas said, I'm Marco Caselli. I, I work for uh, the Siemens Research Department called Cybersecurity and Trust. I started with Siemens five years ago and I was also working for the Siemens CERT. Then I said I moved to, to, to research here. Uh, I'm dealing with a lot of topics, some of them uh, are focusing on OT, attack detection and response. And what I want to say is that we have a lot of collaboration with universities. We try to engage as much as we can with universities. And this is also why we uh, met with Daniel here at the University of Regensburg. He was uh, quite uh, eager to start working on CTI and incident response. And then we start collaborating on, on this topic. And what we're gonna, we're gonna present you today. So uh, let's start with one thing. Uh, CTI is a broad topic, we all know about that, but uh, what we wanted to focus now is the incident response uh, representations and standards. And actually, uh, maybe most of you know about that, there are a lot of standards and formats out there. And uh, uh, there is a community behind this discussing and uh, in this presentation, we're going to uh, name some of them, uh, but of course, we, we dig into the topic a lot, and, and Daniel will share some more information about some of the, of the standards. And the point here was, okay, we have a lot of standards, but how can we compare those standards? So how do I understand, in this case as a company, what I want to use? Of course, I have to describe by use cases and trying to understand uh, what standards, what formats will fit my use cases. Uh, and this is exactly what we have been trying to do and uh, what we have studied for quite some time now. And finally, uh, there is a, 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 diff a slightly different kind of topic because here is like, I'm, I know what standards to use, but uh, is this enough? So uh, when I have uh, some incident response represented in a certain way. Can I really talk with another company and, and share it simply as that? And then that company is capable to use it the very same way I use that standard. Well, this is not so, this is not so easy. Uh, and, and that's why we started uh, reasoning a little bit about what kind of organizational factors uh, have a role when it comes to representing incident response actions. And uh, yeah, again, why did we start with this? Or let's take even a step back, what it was at the very beginning. Well, uh, of course, the community, our community here has always thought how important it was to have CTI artifacts. That was how we started talking about CTIs. And the indicator compromise we were discussing were, of course, IP addresses, hash values, and then domains, and so on and so forth. I mean, that was the very beginning. It was very important, but then we decided to, to go beyond that. And that going beyond was start, starting thinking more about the attacker's behavior. And this is why we have been talking about tactic techniques and procedures, and I don't have to tell you what attack and CAPIC are, because we have been discussing a lot about this also during this, uh, during this conference. And it was a, a very important shift. We, we started understanding that it was more that we had to collect to really understand what was going on. 
And what we want to uh, tell with this, with this uh, talk is that there is even a broader perspective here. And this is the incident response perspective. And this is where all the causes of action uh, play an important role. And this is where, again, all these standards and formats are, uh, are being created. And so, as said, there are a number of that. There is a, an open source community and there are commercial tools there. Here, I, we are just mentioning three of them. Defend is, is promoted by Mitre again. And then we had Kakao and OpenC2. Uh, we as Siemens are actively participating in the standardization of Kakao and OpenC2. We think this is going to be uh, a very important topic for the future. And then let's talk about the motivation. Again, I want to go from a general perspective to a, a more company perspective. And here, I would say, uh, I mean, this really fits the, the, the motto of this conference. It's about strengthening uh, the uh, community, strengthen together. And uh, the general context in which we started thinking that the importance of playbook was, was sharing playbooks with the, within the community and also kind of answering what was promoted by, by uh, uh, governmental agencies. And so you can see here, there was this US executive order that was really and explicitly discussing about playbooks and the importance of having this playbook to, uh, to be shared within the community. And uh, on the other part of the Atlantic, we had the uh, EU Cybersecurity Act. And yet again, there was not as explicit as in the US executive order, but again, some reference to playbooks and how important it was to really exchange this kind of information across security teams. And then we go to the, to the company context, I said, Siemens has started being involved in the topic and we joined uh, uh, one European project, it's called Concordia, and um, for whoever you, of you uh, don't know about the project, so that was one of the four pilots trying to uh, build up this European Cybersecurity Competence Center, this new entity within the European Union that should handle uh, uh, cybersecurity funds for, for the next future. Within this project, we started thinking how to use incident response standards and representation. And we had a couple of use cases in mind. Uh, so, of course, automation was, was very important since the beginning because when we have standards with which we can represent information, then we can have uh, a machine reading these this standards. So, so if, if we make it in a way that this is machine readable, this will allow has to uh, improve our automation. But of course, as I said before, uh, playbook sharing across teams was very important. The, uh, Siemens is a, is a big organization. We have several teams working together. That was one of the things uh, that we, we had in mind. And internal reporting was also one other uh, aspects here because that was about uh, providing some information to, to, to the board, to management on what has happen within an incident response uh, process. And here, uh, <clears throat> before giving the, the, the floor to Daniel, I just wanted to say that we started thinking to all these things and we came up with some questions and we wanted to also uh, collect the feedback from uh, uh, external partners, in this case, uh, a university trying to understand, okay, is there a good way to approach this problem? And uh, as I said before, uh, which kind of representation should we use for our, our use cases? And also thinking a little bit at the next step when it comes to the incident response operations, how will we integrate this representation in our own pipeline, in our own two, uh, two chains? And how do we make sure that we can maintain all these things over the years and over all the changes we can have within the company. And with this question, I will give the floor to Daniel to dig more into the topic. Thanks, Marco. I pick up from here. Um, well, what did we start out with? Well, we had, we'd had a closer look at what standards, what standardization efforts are already out there. And then when we had a closer look at them, we could see that they have different ob objectives. And those objectives, we can use them to do a categorization. So on that slide here, you can see that there are 
that are efforts that are more on a high level approach. So we could say those are frameworks, for example, uh, React or Mitre Defend. Then there are also others that center more on the procedural aspects of incident response. We call them playbook formats. And a prominent example here is Kakao. And then last, going on a granular level, talking about individual commands, um, that is, you can represent those incident response commands using Kakao. Um, roughly, you can say left-hand side is more for representation, right-hand side is more for uh, incident response operations. So, even before looking at the incident response standards and formats, we thought about what is incident response actually all about. And at its heart, it's all about a few structural concepts. Eventually, um, it is a series of workflow steps where a certain person or a certain system, the actuator, is performing an action on a certain artifact. Um, let me give you some very simplified examples here. You can think of incident response as there is an analyst investigating a file, a security system blocking an IP address, or an incident response handler writing a report. Our results of our analysis even show that all standards and formats that we looked at, they have a thing in common that they center, that they cover the incident response action. With the other structural concepts, not so much. They're the different efforts uh, vary and how they handle or how they rep how yeah actuators or artifacts can be represented. Um, so having the standardization efforts um, for the analysis, you want to have criteria how to do the analysis. And while we initially had only the structural concepts, uh, which are workflow, actuator, action, and artifact, uh, we thought the there must be more to it. Um, to actually tell different standards, different formats apart. Um, yeah, our approach here, we published in a scientific paper, and what we did, we derived additional concepts that, are re that we think and are relevant. Our approach here was based on, yeah, we looked at what's out there in academic literature, but also um, looking at the standardization efforts um, and deriving more concepts here. Um, as you can see, there are general concepts we think are relevant, technology concepts and security concepts. Uh, to give you, some, give you some insights here, uh, for example, it's important that your incident response information can be bundled somehow together, so that's aggregability. Then you want to have some versioning, uh, you want to have some readability, machine readability, or only human readability, depending on your use case, um, that's important. And yeah, technology side, is there a community behind a standard? How is it applied? What kind of serialization does it use? And then on a from a security perspective, um, can I indicate that information that is represented um, has a certain confidentiality? Um, is there a way to express how to, um, yeah, how, to how, how incident response information needs to be authorized and before the action is actually executed? And then also prioritization in case you have multiple playbooks, you might want to do one before another. Um, how does it look for one specific standard? I picked Kakao here. Um, yeah, so Kakao characteristics are, as you can hear and see on this slide, so Kakao has workflow steps. Um, it calls its actuator targets, and there are commands. With the parentheses you see on the slide, those concepts are only covered to some extent. So there is, yeah, I guess room for improvement, uh, redefining it in a new iteration of the standard. Um, yeah. This all leads us to the question, you are representatives or you work in companies, you want to use those standards, and the qu overall question, question is, you have a certain use case, which format, which standard should you use? And we think it's best if you refer to, back to those core concepts and use them to assess if a certain format is, is suitable or not. Um, eventually, you could do what we did here as an example for the use case of incident response sharing. Um, you can rank them as there are certain concepts mandatory. You definitely need them. Um, then there are others that are supportive uh, and even others that are less relevant. Pick a few examples here. Workflow. We think you definitely need to document the workflow of your incident response steps 
if you want that, if you want to share that with others. Also, aggregability, bundle things together uh, if you want to share. And then confidentiality, I think, I guess that's uh, easy to see. Um, making clear if you're sharing internally or even externally, um, how, does the how confidential is the information. Um, so, as you can see here, uh, the green, uh, green, orange, and white ranking the concepts, that's what we thought of. Obviously, uh, you can assess more about your organizational context and determine what you think is mandatory or not. Um, as it turns out, uh, if, we use it, if, you use, if you use the ranking as we just did, um, then Kakao is a suitable candidate for incident response sharing. And why is that? Well, Kakao has playbooks that aggregate information. Procedures are represented by workflows. There's a, the Oasis community behind Kakao uh, to back the standard. And then you have TLP and IEP to address confidentiality. Also on the structure here um, on the slide, you can see I took, that, I took the graphic from the Oasis standard. So there's some documentation. And um, on the high level, you have the playbook element and then workflow and workflow steps. Um, so this was all about representing incident response information, but what about actual operations, actually using the information? And there we think it's really crucial. You always use incident response within your company, within your organization, so context matters. And emphasized here with the graphic, um, you might just see a small picture, but it's, 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 it's important to see the bigger picture. Um, so. Does context matter? That's the real question here. Um, looking at the playbooks, um, playbooks always contain some technical information. You all incident, you all have to do with incident response in your daily lives. Um, so there's technical information to be handled, such as you want to block a certain IP address, execute a script, execute a certain command. But then there's also other information that needs to be considered, and that's the organizational information. Um, let's say your company has a ransomware expert, um, Jane Doe. So in the case you have a ransomware incident, you probably contact her. Um, and this, this raises two more questions. Um, is organization-specific information important? And what does determine which information is specific to your organization? Um, we assume that, yeah, the organizational information shapes the incident response process. So there, that there are certain factors that do influence how you do incident response. Three examples we picked here. Um, that could be privacy. Do you, are you doing incident response in the European Union, or is, it, is your incident response affecting EU customer data? Uh, then you might consider uh, the GDPR regulation. Also for responsibility, your organization has a certain chain of command. Um, defines how, how to do reporting, how to, how to, how, how to, which people to involve. Um, so that needs to be considered in the incident response process. And then also people, depending on the, your security team size, do you have five people or 100 people? That should make a difference. Here we want to ask you, do you disagree with us? Do you think these factors, maybe also others, do they not influence the incident response process? And we have preferred something here. Um, we would like you to get your feedback. So please scan the QR code. Um, participation is obviously voluntary and anonymous, but we are really very keen to hear your feedback. Um, do you think there are factors that influence the incident response process? I hope that turns out that it works with the live thing. I mean, I can. If it doesn't work, we will take the questions physically. <laughs> May I first compliment you on putting the URL under the QR code? <laughs> I know it's, it's, it's difficult to type in, but we but thought you got the slides um, yeah, in the app, good. so. I wish everybody did that. <laughs> Okay, I got some results in. Um, I guess most of us, uh, most of you agree with us. 
um, you can still, the slides are shared with you, so can, you can still um, answer the poll afterwards. And yeah, this, this lead, uh, leads us to explain to you why we think, or how we think those factors can modify incident response. Obviously, those are just some very basic examples. And as an example, we start off with a baseline incident response process. Um, that is, you got an incident, you assign an incident handler, you have actions one, actions two, course of actions one, course of actions two, and then you do reporting to the SOC manager and the process ends. Well, in the first scenario, um, you can think of that, as I just uh, mentioned earlier, um, the EU GDPR applies, and that could be that for course of action step two, um, it involves customer data, so you add an additional playbook step before that. In that case, you contact the legal department to check if you can actually do whatever you plan to do in course of action two. Otherwise, the process stays the same. Different scenario um, that could be based on what attacker is, what information do you have about the attacker and the attacker group, um, and how you define responsibility in your company. Um, so this could lead to branching off the process that, oh yeah, you've seen similar activity before, that was crucial to the organization, so you add an additional step for reporting to the CISO and doing other courses of action besides what you would have done usually. And a third scenario is about, um, yeah, do you have certain constraints defined on a technical level, so that could be Course of action two has, you do block a certain IP address. That would be, in case you receive the playbook from external, it says, yeah, please block a certain IP address. But then your organization, your company has defined that we don't, we don't do blocking, we do a redirect. Um, so this could lead to a modification of a playbook step. Um, why is that, why are those factors relevant? I mean, you've seen, they can lead to a modification of a playbook, um, but why are they relevant on a yeah, broader, broader scope? And we think that they can help you, if we know about those incident response factors, that they can help you to separate information in the technical part and the organizational part. And eventually seen here on the, um, on the slide, um, you can have a transformation engine in, ingesting both types of information, so you get a playbook that's specific to your organization. Um, benefits are, if you're sharing playbooks, that can help you to actually use them. Um, adaption, semi-automation, um, because every organization has different systems, different processes, so that would help you here. And then maintenance, um, yeah, if you change information, if changes occur, you don't need to figure out, like ideally, you would type in all the organizational information, and if there's a change there, you can have the same, um, yeah, the same, the same yeah, method um, adapting the technical information. Um, we picked three incident response factors before, um, but the whole thing about incident response factors is a part of an ongoing research project. Um, what you see here, that's what we came up with, but that's in early stages. We try to validate, are those really incident response factors that need to be considered? They can be categorized, so there's the external regulation, compliance elements, so depending on if your company is publicly listed, where you're located at, um, privacy and sector, that can influence the overall incident response process. Also, internal policy, we had the example with you constrain certain technical things. You don't copy files when you do an analysis, analysis um, or you, you do not block IP addresses. That could be the case. Also, attacker, how you do your communication, how you do your reporting, responsibility, and what is attacked, that could make a difference to the incident response process. And last, the overall security setting in your company. How much money do you have? How much people do you have? What technology are you using? And are there limits on how long you can do incident response yeah, investigations. Those might all be factors that influence incident response processes and that, needs, that need to be considered for the playbooks. Um, yeah, we do expert interviews. I've already done a few. 
um, yeah, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, people working in industry. And what we've seen so far, the preliminary, preliminary feedback, is that um, yeah, m most of them see that there are incident response factors that play a role, but to varying degrees. And organizations already consider those. But might not, uh, yeah, but, but might not mention them explicitly. Um, so here, additional feedback needed. We are at the conference until Friday. Um, I'm happy to talk to you if you want to share your uh, your thoughts about the topic. And that just leads us to thank you for your attention. If any, if you have any questions, I think we have some minutes here. Otherwise, yeah, you can still do the poll um, with the QR code up there. So thanks. Thanks. So we have 10 minutes left for presentations, uh, so, uh, for questions, <laughs> sorry. Hello, my name is Vilos. So thank you very much for this dissection. I definitely will use it in my work on what you did. One question for the example use case for incident response sharing. Yeah. I would expect that artifact to be mandatory, not optional or supportive. What was the logic to make it supportive? Um. To give the others the same slide again. Um, yeah. Yeah. The thing here was, depending on who you're sharing with, um, you might not want to disclose that it involves a certain file hash or it involves a certain domain. IP address domain. Um, so that might you be. You would share still some artifacts, right? So at least some artifacts have to be shared because otherwise, what's the meaning of sharing if you don't share anything, just action of sharing? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it, it really depends on the specific case. I mean, but what we wanted to, to define here is it's maybe depending on the, uh, on the kind of information you want to share with other teams, you might want to share more about the procedure and the actions rather than say, hey, you have to do exactly that. It, it really depends on who you're talking to. If it is a technical, if he or she is a technical guy, yeah, for sure you're gonna talk about the artifacts. What do you have to search for? But maybe it's, it's head of a search and then you want to, to explain a little bit more the concept behind what you did and not the whole process. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you very much, um, Daniel and uh, Marco. Um, so now lunch is served downstairs. Uh, don't forget there will be the HEM and the membership updates this afternoon and uh, social events this evening. With that, I hope you enjoy your lunch and see you later. Thank you.